Okay. Um, I'm here with um, Dr. Mark Frank, and I'm uh, a little bit nervous and uh, anxious, but I can't pretend to be relaxed because uh, he is the most, uh, uh, the greatest expert in uh, detecting lies. So, <laughs> well. Well, uh, you just lied, Valentina. Yeah, oh no. <laughs> That's true. Uh, well, um, our readers are mostly uh, psychologists and psychotherapists. You work a lot with investigation agency, uh, police officer, and so on. Uh, but I think that um, your research uh, could be really important also in psychotherapy, because uh, also in psychotherapy, uh, it's very important to be able to catch lies. So what do you think are the implications of your research in psychotherapy? Yes, that is a very good question. I think it works at a number of levels. First is just understanding how the patient is processing the information they are getting from their psychiatrist. A lot of issues come up with uh, drug usage or trying to get drugs that maybe they don't need but they mm. want. There are other elements with psychiatry, like identifying patients who are potentially dangerous and trying to determine when the threats are real or whether the person is, is not actually dangerous or whether they're even carrying a weapon. So there are interview techniques that often rely and observation techniques that rely on nonverbal communication to identify what some of those factors are. I think that also within this the psychiatrist also has to recognize that they are not just simply reading behaviors, but they are also generating behaviors. Yeah. And so you can create a persona, a, a type style of behavior that can produce reactions to you that uh, may mislead you as far as how well this patient is really doing, are they really dangerous, are they really suicidal Yes. or not. Right? All those sorts of considerations. So, you know, keeping in mind you're not just the reader, but you are an emitter of behaviors can help smooth the discussion. Because once you do that and you build good rapport and you get to talk, this is where you'll get the best information. And, of course, this will help the psychiatrist make the best judgments. Have you ever trained psychi uh, psychiatric or psychologists? Uh, I have in some forms. Um, Sometimes in a group where there'll be uh, uh, psychologists and um, psychiatrists and law enforcement and other sorts of people, so in a, in a mixed group per se. Um, and it, no, in fact, I did the uh, personality psychologist a few years back now. And dawning on me, so I have done that. Yes. On what uh, uh, should you focus in this case with psychologists? Respect the mm -hmm. the arguments you well, show us. The issue with them is not going to be as much about lying. It's more about how are they reacting to what you're trying to do. So when you suggest a certain therapeutic program, how open are they to that? Or are they rejecting it? Even though they may say, okay, I'll give it a try. You know, are they really going to give it a try? Or are they just saying that to get rid of you? Now, compliant issues is always a mess. Now, sometimes the patient doesn't know at the time they, meant they give the answer. The other thing is they often give vague responses that sound good. They may say, oh, yeah, how's the new medication? How do you feel? Oh, it's fine. Okay. How good? How bad? What are some other things? So then maybe that would prompt them to ask more questions, yeah. depending on how they said it's fine, to determine, you know, is it really fine? Is there some problem? Are they having trouble keeping up with the therapeutic regimen? Um, and that kind of business. So it just helps to alert them as to just how are they reacting to the things that we are trying to do. Very interesting. Um, what are your future research line? Well, there's a number of lines. So some of it's still trying to figure out how people make judgments of deception, for good or bad. Another line is what's actually happening behaviorally and in what context. So for example, when people are you know, standing up and walking around versus sitting down um, versus other sorts of context. You know, what are the behavioral clues? Are there better ways to measure these? Because one of the problems in doing this type of research is that it is very time um, laborious to code these. 
to do fax coding can yeah. sometimes take you up to you know two or three hours to code one minute of behavior. So can we, we have some technology now. We've got some software that will read some face stuff, and we're still trying to perfect that. And at this point, sort of teaching it, it tre treating it as if it's like an independent coder kind of works for the best. But someday you'd like it to do all the coding. But the downside of that is, of course, once that becomes open, then everybody's going to use it. And people who will not take the time to learn exactly how the face works will use this and start making all sorts of strange claims about the face, and then you've got another problem. So yeah. everything comes with you know, benefits and consequences. Okay. If you think uh, uh, about your uh, research career, uh, what was the most surprising result uh, you found out? Uh, something you didn't expect? Um, Well, I think one thing that's going is we are finding that a little bit of deception and hostility, which were two separate lines of research, are actually coming together. Okay. So the research on emotion, right, in terms of what's happening with lying, well, now we see that's really important in terms of violence and predicting who may turn violent. Right? And so some of that stemmed out of this other work, which at the time we noticed it's often when people were lying, they would sometimes show things like contempt and disgust, which we sort of couldn't figure out because in these studies they were stealing from people. And so we realized part of that is the lie, part of that is the hostility. And so now those two lines of work, that really surprised yeah. me. I just thought they were just independent. Okay. And now they've really become just part of the same, part of a similar process. And so I that was pretty cool. That was probably the most um, uh, surprising. And the other thing that was surprising is every time in the, in the early days when we would do a study and say, okay, we'll see the role of emotions and deception, and while recording it live and watching it, I would always be disappointed and say, hmm, it didn't seem like there was a lot. And then you go frame by frame, and it was, oh my goodness, there's so much here. In, in the last study we had... It had to be, I can't remember the number, I think it was around 40% of the negative emotions that betrayed a liar were less than half a second long. Okay. So you miss it. But now, of course, with the years and years of looking at this, plus with all the micro training and everything else, now I can see them more quickly. But I remember the first few years in the 90s with, with Dr. Ekman and stuff and just thinking, mm, I think we got a lot. And I start coding it. And then, they, oh my goodness, this is all, it, we're, we're getting, this is, wow, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, several studies uh, show that if I pose an emotion, I can feel it. Um, but does it work only if I pose it uh, correctly? I mean, if I fake a smile, right. but I move just uh, my mouth and right. not my eyes, uh, I can't feel uh, mm -hmm. joy. Right. Okay. Um, how does it influence the ability to hide an emotion um, with another one? Mm. So what you're saying, um, if you, what you're saying is if you're feeling like one emotion. Yeah, but I fake another one correctly. But so, let's say you're, you're angry, but you're going to smile and try yeah. to look happy. Mm -hmm. And if you do pose that smile properly, can yeah. you override the anger? Yeah. Um, I'm not exactly sure of the, the science on that, but based on what happens with my guess is it would help do that, yes. But I can't tell you with 100% certainty, okay. so, but that's my speculation. Okay. Um, do you think people can learn to lie? I know you don't teach lie. We're about catching lies, not about making them. The but, world has enough of those. <laughs> yeah. We don't need to find any more. But it's just a matter of how other people are good in detecting mm -hmm. lie. So if I um, get away, it's just because the other one is not so good in detecting lie. Mm -hmm. Well, people vary quite a bit in their ability to do this. So, I mean, this is one of the things you see in research is that there's certain of the subjects that people are judging. Everybody gets that one right. And so, and then people are kind of eh, on the others, and so that brings the average to that 54% that showed yesterday. 
as far as like what the average accuracy is for, for people. Um, but again, with the liars, you can tell them what to do, but the question is, can they do it? So I can tell you, don't worry, Valentina, relax. And, you know, I say, okay. But, yeah, yeah, sure, if we could do that, right, we would not need psychologists, right? You say, okay, well, yes, I'm depressed. We well, should be happy. Okay, hang on. Ding, there, I'm happy. Great, life is wonderful. But we can't do that with our emotions. So I can, you know, you, I use the example in the questions here, you know, about you've got to give the big presentation and your friend tells you to relax. And you go, oh, wow, I didn't think of that. Oh, of course you did. But can you do it? And again, particularly when you're live and with other human beings, because this is what we are wired for. Our brains are wired to respond to three-dimensional people and things in the environment. So, sure, I can show you a cardboard cutout, I can do this, but there's no thing like an actual human. So I can practice trying to look effective as a liar when I'm in my bedroom looking at a mirror, but then the first time I have to stand in front of you as a human being scrutinizing me, eh, I can't practice that. And so it makes it very hard. Now, that being said, there are certainly things you can do. There's been some studies showing that if you teach people some of these criteria in the memory that we talked about and teach them how to try to speak in a way to take account of that, that you can do some things to, to hide your lies. So okay. some of it can be trained, but not all of it. Okay. Um, what do you think of uh, Light to Me and Criminal Minds? Uh, are they accurate? Well, all TV shows are going to have a mixture of fact and fiction. Um, I think uh, Lie to Me was the best of the bunch. Um, a lot of it was based on uh, some of the joint work it did with Dr. Eckman because the main character was loosely based on, on Dr. Eckman. And so that one, I don't know, 80% accurate, 20%, you know, fiction. fantasy. But that's really high for a television show. Usually it's about maybe 30%, 40%, and you know, so on. But then again, you know, Dr. Acton was the scientific advisor, so it's going to be better because of that. So, But, um, you know, that's just, you know, how, this, uh, how these things go. They have to entertain. But, you know, that show, you know, the guy's always right. And, <laughs> of course. And he makes his judgment in a fraction of a second. Real life doesn't work like that. Okay. Um... How your skill to detect lie uh, influences your relationship with other people? Because I, I think that this, you can't turn off your ability to detect lie. Well, I don't know if it's about um, detecting lies, because I tend to be a very trusting person. Ah, okay. So I will notice things, but what I will do is I will misinterpret them often okay. to my detriment. So I say, oh, Valentina showed me some fear when she said she didn't... But, you know, she's probably nervous. She seems like a nice person. She's probably under stress. And, I come, and, and that hurts the judgment process because there's, there's two things you need. You have to first detect something, but then you have to interpret it properly. Because remember, none of those signs guarantee that the person is lying. They are signs that somebody's thinking on their feet. They're signs that they're recalling an event they didn't experience. They're signs they're feeling an emotion. So you still have to interpret why are they feeling that emotion or why are they having to think on their feet when I ask them, you know, their name. I asked you your name. Bang, Valentina. Less than half a second you had the name out, didn't break eye contact, straightforward. Right? So, again, this is, you know, just how I think the, the process goes here. Okay. Um, you work with Paul Ekman. Uh, have you ever tried to lie to him? <laughs> No. <laughs> okay. Big mistake. Yeah. Okay. Uh, did you enjoy the interview? Your interview? Here? Yeah. Yes. Very much. Are so. you lying to me? No. Nope. No. Nope. Okay. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, I should have done that. Sorry. Uh, I don't know what am I trying to do? Are you lying to me? Uh, let's see. I have to be. Yes. That's it. <laughs> okay. I'm very tired, but you asked very good questions, so okay. this was pleasant. Thank you.